This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. So this is Relatively Speaking, and I am Dr. Susan Buttress at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to be talking about trauma-informed care what it is and and why you or a loved one may need this trauma-informed care. Trauma is widespread, costly, and can wreak havoc in lives. And it really can be caused by many different things, such as a natural disaster, war, of course, violence, violence in the home, domestic violence, abuse, neglect, other things that can be very harmful. Obviously, we in Mississippi and our surrounding states have been experiencing several different traumas with the weather and and the harmful effects of that, people losing their homes, lose, losing all their possessions. Um, there's also been trauma from school shootings in the area trauma from violence. And so we are better now um, at knowing how to treat trauma than we used to be. And over the last 10 years, especially for children and adolescents, a new terminology has come about called trauma-informed care. And it's a specific way that we should be caring for individuals who experience trauma. So today I'm very excited to have Gigi Holder with us. She's a licensed clinical social worker who has some specialized training in trauma-informed care. And Gigi is at the Center for the Advancement of Youth. Welcome, Gigi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you, as always, for coming in and lending your expertise with us. There, there are several things that we want to talk about, um, and I know we'll first start talking about just trauma in general, and and exactly what that does to an individual, and and why it's not just something that we experience immediately and then it goes away, right? Right, correct. So, so talk to us about the. Trauma, as we are talking about trauma, that's significant enough for an individual, say, to need therapy. Right, absolutely. Um, I think you framed it really well earlier when you're mentioning that trauma can be from a variety of different type of events, um, and there's so many different components that go into it that uh, can lead to the the effects of the trauma on ourselves individually and the treatment that we need later on, depending on how old we were when the trauma happened, who all was involved, uh, the the duration, the frequency, the intensity, all of that. So, so much um, can go into that. And so once we are able to notate that and understand it, then we're able to get a better idea of how we need to um, approach and treat that trauma um, and whether it is at a point in time or if it actually is lifelong treatment, if the person needs to make sure that they are receiving um, some assistance and treatment with for that therapy or for that trauma um, for, for the duration. So there might be some individuals who need lifelong treatment for their trauma. Yeah. And it could be that, you know, a, a lot of times when we think about therapy, it has to be every week or something like that. It might be that individuals need a check in. 
You know, right. I actually do know a close friend of mine um, because of a, a suicide that they had from a very close fam- family member. Um, this person makes sure that they have um, that they check in with their therapist every few months, mm-hmm. you know, and that also can be because we're, you know, life is still happening around us. You know, right. we're still dealing with all kinds of stressors and everything like that. And you never know what type of stress from whatever else is going on in our lives could be a trigger. You know, it's like it's like water poured into a bucket. It makes it overflow. And we got to make sure that we are tending to that bucket. So that's what therapy is meant to be able to do for us. Help us to maintain, empty that water out of one bucket so that we can tend to something else. Yeah. So so therapy for for anything might be pretty intensive initially, mm-hmm. but you shouldn't if it's the right kind of therapy, you shouldn't have to expect that it's going to be weekly therapy for years and years. Is right. that right? Right, exactly. But perhaps mm-hmm. need a check-in, which right. makes a lot of sense. Right, absolutely. A lot of different therapy methods, and uh, they'll um, outline, uh, you know, all of this information is available for any of us to be able to 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 find even to ask our therapist to say, you know, how long is this treatment method? What is to be expected? For some, it might be, it'll say, um, it's recommended that this is uh, anywhere from eight to 25 sessions, anywhere from four to six months, however they outline it to give an individual an idea of if this is going to be successful, if they're going to get the result that they want to get, it really is about an investment at that time uh, for the recommended time. And then it can be tapered down um, if needed. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of talking generally mm-hmm. about therapy, and, mm-hmm. and I want to talk a little generally now about um, trauma mm-hmm. before we get into trauma-informed care. Yes. So so almost all families, or mm-hmm. if not all families, experience some sort of trauma. Right. But it seems like some people handle trauma differently. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about why that is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, resilience is a big key factor in how any and all of us approach a trauma, how we deal with that, how we receive what was happening. Um, Our support systems, again, who is around us? Who do we have to go to to help us manage these traumas, uh, that trauma experience, to talk about it? Um, You know, like our loving circles. Um, Again, uh, different stressors, different things going on in our lives. Do we have that opportunity to really step away and tend to that trauma? Or are we having to to work through that trauma in the midst of working through other things. Um, so there, again, a lot of different factors can play a part in how we are um, managing a trauma that we have um, experienced. So you you talk uh, about the supports that you have around mm-hmm. you. What mm-hmm. what kind of supports around you might be more protective right. from experiencing severe trauma that won't go away? Right. Um, so definitely um, our our family and friends. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, having the, uh, you know, kind of like our smaller inner circle around us. Um, those the, those individuals who know us best because they're going to be the ones who either see us on a day to day basis if they're talking to us and they're able to kind of ping, kind of tune into, you know, something's not sounding right. It's like I, I talked to Gigi earlier and, you know, something just sounded a bit off or she's not really acting like herself, you know, and that she's not sounding like herself, things like that. And they're the ones that can hopefully step in and say, I'm noticing this about you, you know, and if they are aware of the trauma, it's like maybe it's time for a check in, you know, if the person hasn't been involved in therapy yet, maybe it's that friend or loved one to say, maybe it's time to start that. So those who know us better best are also able to tune in to us to, to make sure um, to kind of keep an eye on us to note how trauma, how anything could be affecting us. And just having that support system alone mm-hmm. can 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 be bolstering, right? Yeah. You know, I was um, talking to a group of teachers most mm-hmm. recently mm-hmm. and and one of the teachers noticed a student who had walked into the hallway mm-hmm. at the school that he had a frown on his face and he would looked his head was down he wasn't mm-hmm. making eye contact with anybody and mm-hmm. he said hey man you look like you're not having a good day. What's mm-hmm. up? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing can be so helpful, right? Yeah, very much. Yeah. That is exa- exactly an example right there. Because if you're used to seeing someone who is kind of bright, bubbly, happy, and you know gregarious, just talking to different people and everything like that, but then they come in and, like you said, their head is hung more down and they're kind of more secluded, just kind of isolating themselves, then again, that can kind of let you know, it's like, oh, okay, something's kind of going on. You know, well, let me check in with this person. That's our cue to ask that question, say, 
hey, are you okay? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. And not only does that help you identify, but that also lets that individual know that mm-hmm. somebody cares about yeah. him or her, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that somebody's noticing that right. things aren't good. Yeah. Uh, I would think it would be very, very sad and very lonely mm-hmm. feeling if you were having a terrible day mm-hmm. and and nobody seemed to notice. Right. Absolutely. Because sometimes we ourselves may not even notice. We're so engulfed in what we're feeling and thinking at that moment that we might not even know that we're kind of being snappy or we just mm-hmm. want to be left alone or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Right. Um, and then, yeah. So if we have someone else that approaches us about it and say, like, you know, hey, it's like I notice that, you know, that you're kind of snapping off a little bit. What's going on? It's like, oh, really? When you just thought that you're like, I'm just trying to get people away from me. Right. I didn't know I was coming across as being like really, really rude or something like that. Sometimes we, yeah, in the midst of all that, we may not know how how, how we are coming off to those around us. Right. Yeah. This is Relatively Speaking, and I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Gigi Holder, a licensed clinical social worker with specialized training in trauma-informed care. So we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly trauma-informed care means. We've talked a lot about trauma, mm-hmm. and we know that it can come in any in many forms. Yes. Yes. And some people are going to do better with trauma and mm-hmm. recover more quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, some not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in a minute, I'd like for us to cover... Um, who, what are those signs that mm-hmm. someone really needs to start getting therapy? But mm-hmm. before we do that, let's talk about what trauma-informed care really is. Can right. you define that for us? Yeah. Um, again, that this is, it's kind of becoming like a more, a more popular catchphrase these days, trauma-informed care. You might hear someone say T-I-C. Um, but trauma-informed care, it's, it's really... Brought, uh, gotten more traction probably within the last uh, 10 or so years and it really is an approach either on the both on the the individual level so person to person level but then also um, agency or organization level how is it that the individual how is it that the agency is approaching and treating trauma of those individuals who that have experienced this so what do you mean by agency Mm -hmm. are you talking about something like the center for the advancement of youth yep. or a mental health center or absolutely something like all that. the above it, okay. like it, it, it goes down to the smaller clinic so yeah absolutely with k is it um looking at the you know we'll just say for example the holder um the bigger organization children's in mississippi how was umc you know just kind of, you can think of it kind of on a grander scale um because there are different policies different measures uh different methods that can be put in place at each of these levels to make sure it's like uh, that that trauma informed care really is being exercised. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so it is not just one type of therapy. Is that correct? No. Right, because it's more. Right. It's an approach. It's, it's so there's some principles yes. of trauma informed mm-hmm. care. So let's talk through mm-hmm. what those principles really are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and kind of depending on where you might see it, there might be five principles. It might be six, and, and all that. So we, sometimes you can kind of see a little bit of a difference but the main ones um that 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 i have come across and these are um, promoted by the uh, substance abuse and mental health services administration so that's samsa um some key principles that they um, outline are safety so how is it that the, uh, the individual that the agency the organization is making uh those who have experienced trauma how is this safe um, is, is it a safe space from what's on the, the walls, like the design of the space, um, uh, you know, wording, if you have um, like loudspeakers, if you have like videos or anything, you know, like in lobby areas, uh, you know, advertisements, anything along that line, um, your, your, your vis- visible um, materials around. How is it that this space is is creating safety for a person to even want to address their trauma because if a person does not feel safe then that they're, they're not going to approach it so give an example of mm-hmm. say you walk into a room mm-hmm. and um a, a, where you're supposed to receive mm-hmm. counseling that might be a 
negative trigger or something that mm-hmm. may make them feel unsafe? What right. would that be? Yeah, um, it could be that if the space doesn't feel very warm. So if you mm-hmm. walk into a space where maybe there aren't a lot, there's not a lot of color in the room. There's mm-hmm. nothing on the walls. Uh, there's no words of encouragement anywhere, anything mm-hmm. like that. That could be taken as, oh, it's like, you know, this almost feels like, you know, just a place that I don't want to be. You know, right. I don't feel an institution. Exactly. Right. Basically. Yeah. Um, versus if there's somewhere where, you know, and especially depending on your audience, if it's like for, for kids, for example, are there stuffed animals? Are there games around? Are there posters with um, familiar uh, characters from cartoons or anything like that? Something that brings along some comfort. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that safety, yes. it's sort of a comfortable space. Right. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. that's one. So that's one. Um, trustworthiness and transparency is another principle that's outlined. And that is about, so one, if a person comes to the space, but then also who they're interacting with, do they feel that this person or this institution, this organization is a trustworthy space mm-hmm. in order to be able to talk about the trauma? So knowing, um, and that could be learning what their policies are. It is important for us to be able to say that, uh, express about confidentiality, that what is said in this space stays here. The only time that I would need to express anything to anyone else is you know xyz if we walk through that so really um acknowledging our confidentiality uh, confidentiality um policy is important um and just letting a person know like who who it is that we're treating that um uh that what they share with us um the the overall goal is so that um we can make improvements in their life to the situation and nothing that they say is going to be used against them in any other type of way so that trust uh, and making that clear that transparency is another important that's when you know that trauma-informed care is being um, uh, emphasized, is being uh, uh, utilized. I would imagine part of that that trust would mm-hmm. be that someone feels that they're really being listened to, right. that you have somebody, a therapist, mm-hmm. who is also a good listener and yes. will just stop and really hear what the individual's saying, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that could be, so on the individual level, that skill right there would be called active listening. Mm-hmm. And so that's when a person is talking and the person who's receiving that information, they can use phrases like, you know, I hear you, um, you know, thank you for telling me. I can see that when you are talking about this, how uh, how it affects you, lets them know that you are present in that moment with them instead of just asking question after question, trying to move through, uh, you know, sequence after sequence of the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think this can pertain to any kind of mm-hmm. therapy, right? Right. That you want a therapist who is an active listener. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's some, there's some other signs that mm-hmm. I might just point out myself of somebody making eye contact with you, mm-hmm. really looking at you, mm-hmm. really following the the mood and the body language. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, a good active listener is somebody who leans a little bit forward mm-hmm. and um, is really there and engaged. Mm-hmm. And if you make a comment mm-hmm. that you're expecting a response, that they really do mm-hmm. respond back. Right. Is there ever a time when perhaps someone ask you a question Mm -hmm. and you feel like, oh, gosh, that's something I probably shouldn't answer for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there a time? What would you do when Mm -hmm. something like that happens? Yeah. So if you so, you know, as a clinician, that is one thing, too, that and and that sometimes we are we're cognizant of we're aware of that, you know, that this is going to be sensitive, even stating that at times we know that, you know, we know that we're in this space where we're going to talk about something really, really hard. I'm going to ask you some questions and they might be a bit sensitive, but really setting that premise right there. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be Mm -hmm. beneficial for the individual, I'll say that the client and the therapist so that they know, too, it's like, hey, this is uncomfortable for me, too. You know, regardless of training, regardless of, you know, how many times I've met have talked to or dealt with trauma in whatever instances um, with other individuals, uh, you know, we're still human. And we both are still going to feel and react to the information that is said and heard in different ways. So I think that that's something. And then also sitting in silence. That is another like catchphrase, a favorite phrase of mine when I think about um, going through the therapy process is being able to. So if you ask a question and you don't get an immediate response, is the therapist okay with sitting in silence? 
uh, and, and, and offering some, you know, some, some support in that moment to say, take your time. I can, you know, I can tell that this is, you know, this is getting tough for you and just letting that moment happen. Or they say like, if that's too tough right now, maybe we can visit it another time that in those moments, but that can also come from sitting in silence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so those those pauses, yeah. you know, I know we've talked sometimes mm-hmm. about counting to 10 yeah. or counting slowly to 13 mm-hmm. to, to really allow things to sit. Yes. And I, I do think that's a really important piece yeah. of being a good listener. Mm-hmm. And so many people get uncomfortable with yeah. even short pauses. Yes. Obviously, on radio, we don't have very long pauses mm-hmm. because we want to use all our airtime. Mm-hmm. But in in the the real counseling world, so many times that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Right. There's power in the pause. That's another like kind of catchphrase <laughs> that I've just kind of taken like on and remember. There's power in the pause. Okay. Yeah. So let's go on more principles in mm-hmm. in um, trauma informed care. Yes. So another one would be to notate would be um, peer support, and that is that. Um, not only for the, the, the client at that time, um, that to make sure that, let's say that if they are having a, a particular response, um, at, that, uh, as they're uncovering the trauma, as they're going through that process. Um, and in some organizations, um, they do have this, so they'll have, um, a, a trauma response team. It's not a crisis team, but it's more so that if someone is experiencing something in a moment, is there someone else that can be called in to just come and either sit with the individual? Maybe it's to have them take a break because sometimes it, it just depends. Um, maybe the therapist is the one to be able to do that, but are there others, um, that, uh, in that agency that are able to take on that role as well. Um, but then also for the therapist as well, too, um, because therapists are taking this information. They're walking, they're walking alongside the client through the therapeutic process. So in the agency, um, or, or does the therapist have supports that they also can fall, lean on yeah. to help them, you know, process and go through to make sure that they are able to, it's, like, it's almost like you got to get ready for battle each time. Is the therapist ready each time when the client comes in to say, okay, we're ready for this together? Because yeah. we, we, both of them uh, have to be in their own positions to be ready. Because yeah. um, there there are some times mm-hmm. when therapists who repeatedly all day long yeah. um, hear about trauma mm-hmm. and, and stress and mm-hmm. say disaster and d- domestic violence, mm-hmm. um, it can be very hard on them. Yeah. And there is sort of a secondary reaction mm-hmm. from hearing repeated terrible trauma, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think for our listeners to to understand that you want to make sure that you know the you understand that the the therapist also needs to be prepared. Mm-hmm. So what so what if you go in mm-hmm. for therapy mm-hmm. and you see as a receiver that perhaps your therapist is not able to be supported, mm-hmm. supportive, because mm-hmm. it seems that maybe she or he mm-hmm. is in need of support themselves. Right. What What would you do as, as that patient? Yeah, it might be that you recognize, and I think that's important to know that it, it's, it's a reciprocal um, relationship mm-hmm. right there. And the, especially the client has the right and is able to say, it's like, I'm not sure if I'm getting what I feel like I need from this, uh, from this therapist, from this therapy, whatever it is my, that might be. Um, and so um, the, the client absolutely is in the right to be able to say, it's like, you know, I'm kind of noticing like maybe today feels a little off. Um, you know, maybe some some of the conversation has to be tabled. Mm-hmm. Maybe the appointment has to be rescheduled. Um, you know, uh, in in some instances, um, the 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 client absolutely can definitely take on that stance. But I I, I also more so put it on the the therapist because sure. we individuals know like we have to do those check-ins yeah we have to check in we have to know um 
where and when we are at a point where we're reaching what they call burnout Mm -hmm. or we're just saying like, okay, I need to need to take a pause from this or even being able to say to the client the next time we see them, it's like, you know, the last time that we talked, I noticed that that was really hard, you know, even for for you. But then also for me, too, I noticed that as you were talking, I had this reaction, too. And, you know, I also noticed that I kind of had to work through that a little bit. That comes with rapport building. That comes with time um, and that that comfort in that relationship, because maybe Maybe not all therapists feel comfortable in being able to do that, right. um, but we're human, and yeah. you know. We, and in all fairness, mm-hmm. like you said, I think the therapist should be trained. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're truly a professional in this area, they mm-hmm. should be able to recognize the signs. Right. And so, listeners, I would say that if mm-hmm. if there does appear to be. Mm-hmm. A time when you feel like the therapist is not Mm -hmm. moving through Mm -hmm. and not being that active listener, Mm -hmm. not able to be compassionate Mm -hmm. and seemingly not connected to you, perhaps it might mean that you need to seek other counseling. Right, right. Right. Yeah, you said a key um, phrase right there where it's um, if you're not moving through. Because if you feel like you're stuck as a client, if they feel like they're stuck and just like, we just kind of seem to be mulling over the same thing or, you know, each week is kind of feeling the same. We're not truly moving through the process. Then that can be an indicator that, you know, um, that maybe um, seeking out um, therapy from another uh, clinician um, might be needed. Right. Mm-hmm. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Gigi Holder, licensed clinical social worker. And today we're talking about trauma-informed care. We're going to finish up on what the principles of what trauma-informed care um, truly should be. Um, we've gone over a couple and we're going to mm-hmm. now do the last three. Mm-hmm. Gigi, why don't you talk? to us about that because Mm -hmm. then I want us to move into the signs Mm -hmm. of who, when do you know someone really needs to move into this kind of care? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one other tenant or principle um, to be mindful of with trauma-informed care is collaboration. And Mm -hmm. what that really refers to is that when it comes to trauma treatment, it really should be a team effort, a team relationship between the client and the therapist. It's not just the therapist saying, okay, because you've told me this, this, and this, then this is what you need to work on, or we're going to do this. You know, the, the, the therapist can have the expertise, so to speak, but then also the client knows themselves as well, you know, and, and having an active participation in the therapy. And if the client is not doing that or not wanting to, then the therapist needs to be able to address, okay, what's preventing this, especially if it's something that is um, uh, known to treat a particular symptom. So we'll just say, for example, um, if a if a person is um, hypervigilant, you know, or dealing with some type of anxiety or something like that, if there's some type of exposure that the therapist is recommending, trying to move the client to closer to doing, but there's the client is still staving away from that, then saying, okay, then there's still some processing that we need to do. Talk to me about that. So it's not about the therapist just pushing, pushing, pushing. It is a collaborative effort. Yeah. So mm-hmm. hypervigilant, mm-hmm. that means just always on guard, right? Yes, being jumpy. Being, yeah. being mm-hmm. very jumpy. Yeah. And perhaps that is... When you enter a room full of people or something like that. So Mm -hmm. the therapist might say, okay, we're going to go into a room full of people. Mm -hmm. And so to to be able to to move through that. Mm -hmm. So you said collaborative Mm -hmm. team approach. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the team besides the... The therapist mm-hmm. and the yeah. patient? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially depending on the type of therapy method. So if it's something where, especially for children, and the parent or the caregiver is needing to be involved, um, then it absolutely is a, a collaborative effort because we also need to um, hear from the parent, from the caregiver, um, where are they in this process? Because they're also the ones going home with the child, you know, or with the adolescent um, and, you know, and having to manage the any behaviors or anything like that any symptoms that might be experienced in the home environment um and there might be some things that they might not be 
either the parent or the caregiver might not be ready to face or to hear. Um, and that's something to be mindful of and to help uh, them get ready so that they can in turn be an even stronger support for the for the child. So that, yeah, that that speaks definitely to the, the collabor- uh, collaborative effort. Right. Um, and all, overall with trauma-informed care. Yep. Okay. Um, next would be um, empowerment. Mm, so uh, I like that one. Yeah, yeah. me too. Absolutely. Um, and that really speaks to, um, is it that, you know, it, it's not about making the client feel like they are um, uh, a victim, it's more so about so you'll sometimes you'll hear the word victim, but a lot of people are trying to spin it now to say survivor. Okay. You survived yeah. this trauma um, because just the the different meanings right there. It's kind of like the different connotation with those different words. Um, so really, is it that in the therapy method? How is that the the client is able to feel stronger, more powerful? Like this is what happened to me, but it does not define me. Mm-hmm. And really um, uh, instilling uh, that sense of um, yeah, just that courage, that bravery, that bravery, helping them to pinpoint, hey, in the midst of experiencing this trauma um, uh, that the, you endured, you're still here, you're still standing, um, you know, uh, pulling out those positives um, uh, and, and really allowing the client to see that. And um, because that gets shrouded over when trauma, when something like that has happened, when the negative, we lose sight of the positive. Right. How are we bringing that out? The other thing I, I did want us to include in here as we're talking through this mm-hmm. is um, the fact that sometimes people in your life mm-hmm. are sort of Debbie Downers, mm-hmm. the, the people who continue to bring you back to the trauma, remind you of the mm-hmm. trauma, pull you down. Um, do you have some advice about yeah. do you need to distance from yes. those people? Yes, absolutely. So the big word is boundaries Mm -hmm. Um, that that can be hard to do for any of us. And especially when it comes to those closest in our lives, our families, our friends, because we feel like we're maybe being rude or pushing them away or something like that. Um, And it's, it's not about that. When we set up a boundary, it's about remaining safe. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to keep ourselves in a positive space, because if we're around someone that all they want to do is talk about the negative, like you said, they're a Debbie Downer. And then that brings our mood down. It's just like, ah, I know I don't really want to be around this. So maybe it's that I don't, you know, get in touch with so and so, you know, I don't see them every single day, but maybe I just see them on the weekends. Maybe Mm -hmm. we save our conversations for then Um, because it can be draining. For us. And wouldn't it be appropriate to say, I don't mm-hmm. want to revisit this with you? Yeah, absolutely. To, to draw a boundary. Yeah, and, yeah. To set a know, stern boundary. Absolutely. Said, yeah. yeah. I, I think sometimes we in the South are mm-hmm. so polite mm-hmm. that we just don't like to to say things as as concretely mm-hmm. as that. But sometimes I think it's really important mm-hmm. for for us to feel empowered, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. To to take charge mm-hmm. and, and know what we need mm-hmm. and to declare what we need. Mm-hmm. It's not being selfish. It's right. being protective. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah. And empowered. Yeah, absolutely. So empowerment. I mm-hmm. like that one. Yeah. And then the last one is? Uh, the last one is uh, humility and responsiveness. Mm. So that really speaks to to, again, um, how is it that the, the, the therapist or in this environment that uh, a client is really feeling like, again, they're not being that victim, but, you know, they're not treated as a victim. Um, they're, the trauma that they experience is not constantly being pitted at them or stated in ways um, uh, that makes them feel like, you know, that, that re-traumatization of right. that. Um, but it's more about... Um, uh, allowing them to feel like again they're they're being seen and uh and responding to whatever the need is at that time because sometimes a client may come in and you know you're supposed to be quote unquote working on trauma but maybe that's not where they are maybe they need something else in that moment and it is uh, to trauma informed care is responding to that need in that moment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So would you give us an example of that Mm -hmm. so that perhaps they need more 
mindfulness kind of work or would it be more? It would be so. Um, and I've had this uh, before where um, I was actually doing um, some trauma therapy um, with the teenagers who's a 16 year old at the time. Um, you know, we, we'd been working on things for quite a quite a while. Um, but I remember there was a session where she came into where um, she's getting ready to come up on come up on finals for mm-hmm. uh, in school. Mm-hmm. And that's all that she wanted to talk about and the projects that she had to do and all of that. And I had to be mindful about, okay, not trying to redirect her to be like, okay, well, but but what about, you know, why you're here and all that? Where she was right now at that moment was stressing about her finals. And I just had to like, you know, it was kind of like that wake up call for me at that moment. Um, to just kind of let her have that space. Yeah. Let her have that time. Yeah. Talk through yep. what you would do, mm-hmm. how you would prepare, how mm-hmm. you could organize yep. and, and the like, which yep. may seem like you're taking a far left turn right. from mm-hmm. that. But at the moment, mm-hmm. that's what that individual needed. Yeah. Right? We feel like we're getting away from the assignment and right. really we're still on task. We are. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, Lots, lots of principles Mm -hmm. there. Um, Why don't we talk about how do you know somebody really needs this therapy? Mm -hmm. Because there are other therapies, Mm -hmm. there are behavioral therapies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people don't need therapy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about those signs. Mm -hmm. And then, then I'd like for us to finish with how do you access those services? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, well, some of the bigger things is that to, to highlight when a person needs, uh, therapy and to make sure that they are going to a space that enforces, uh, that really, uh, emphasizes trauma informed care is, um, really notating how is the, the past events or event, affecting the person at that time. And again, it doesn't matter if it was 15 years ago, you know, uh, 15 days ago, but really looking at um, is this having a detrimental and how much to an extent uh, of of a, a detrimental effect on the person currently, if they are not able to function in their day to day routines, mm-hmm. if their relationships are starting to be strained, especially when they were, you know, stronger, more positive relationships, friendships, intimate relationships, um, they are not able to, you know, kind of w- w- walk as they were in their lives before, uh, you know, b- before the trauma before happened. the trauma yeah, absolutely yeah so there's been a ever, shift for them is it ever too late um, no. for trauma informed care so mm-hmm. if there had been for example mm-hmm. um, an 18 or 19 year old who who had sexual abuse mm-hmm. when they were 5 mm-hmm. um, not too late to to come back in and do mm. trauma informed care for that, right? No, yeah. not at all. Um, there's a quote that I like to that that kind of comes to my mind where it, it, it mentions, um, "There's no time stamp on trauma," no. so meaning that we're still going through our lives. Life is a journey anyway, and we never know at what point in time, to what extent, from whatever cause, that something can be a trigger, can be a reminder, and then it have an effect in that moment. And that at that moment is when um, that 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 concern needs to be addressed. So, right. yeah, there's no time limit on it. Yeah, that's to me, that is something I want all of our listeners to mm-hmm. really hear and understand mm-hmm. that if you are continuing to have a trigger that takes you back to mm-hmm. the depths of depression or mm-hmm. the heights of anxiety mm-hmm. that happened, you know, 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. Getting some help can make a huge difference, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're not necessarily talking about, in fact, we're not talking at all about medication right now. Right. What we are talking about is therapy that allows you to to move to the now, here mm-hmm. and now, mm-hmm. and live in the present and not continue to revisit that past, right? Right. Absolutely. Because again, um, and, and it takes us individually to be able to uh, recognize how is that that past event affecting us you know again like you said if it's something 15 20 25 years ago but now it's affecting us from we have trust issues you know or or we don't want to go be in big crowds or whatever it is um that can if it's related to that that instance it's it's still relevant to be able to address that no matter how long ago that it was and and no matter how how i always say too like you know how big or small either sometimes we'll 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 
think of, oh, well, this wasn't big enough. Like, does this really count as trauma? If it affects you, if you think about it and whatever like that, then that that still grounds to to uh, allow for it to be addressed. So it might be like a chronic bullying yes. incident that happened in high school, yeah. right? Yeah. Or um, you know, a, a motor vehicle accident mm-hmm. that happened years ago, mm-hmm. but you continue to have difficulty yeah. in certain areas. Yeah. You know, driving in the rain. Yeah. Or, whatever. Absolutely. Right? Um, what you were saying about, um, so like if you're dealing with bullies, so that made me think of like conflict resolution. If that is something where like a skill that you feel like you hadn't really developed or honed because of, you know, an experience that you have, maybe it could have been with bullies. It could have been like, you know, I was so used to having to fight or having to be, you know, uh, we resolve things with our fist, you know, right. but, but being able to develop that skill later on, that is something that couldn't be addressed um, in there. So in these last couple of minutes, Mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about how do you access um, Mm -hmm. where in Mississippi can you receive trauma-informed care? Mm -hmm. So really, um, so and based on the different principles that we outlined, um, I hope that this is um, uh, being able to uh, alert individuals to what to look for and what right. to ask right. as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you can go into a, a person can go into any facility with the clients uh, or with the, with therapist um, or if it's one like private practice with just one therapist and just saying, you know, hey, you know, um, what is how do you approach trauma? How is it that, you know, what therapy methods do you use? Um, just trying to get a sense of um, how is it that this individual and this agency are set up to uh, to address the mm-hmm. trauma. Mm-hmm. Um uh, yeah, so asking those questions um, and then um, and, and if you're able to kind of doing a little bit of research, if able um, to to because some agencies will actually say more and more agencies are actually saying now um, they might have it on their website or something like that and advertising that we are a trauma informed care agency. We are a trauma informed care institution. So that is something, too, um, right. that we can also be um, uh, mindful of. Yeah. Um, as we're looking looking for resources. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I know we have them at the Center for the Advancement of Youth Mm -hmm. at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. We have um, telehealth, telebehavioral services for that Mm -hmm. also, correct? Mm -hmm. And so even if you don't live in the Jackson metropolitan Mm -hmm. area, you can access those services. I know there there are certainly other entities out there. and, and again, we can put some other potential services on our website, on this podcast, mm-hmm. um, and so that others can access it, right? Right. So, yeah. Any last thoughts? Any parting, parting thoughts? Um, you know, I think I'll just kind of end on that word that both of you and I, um, you know, really emphasize just empowerment. Mm-hmm. I really hope that this is uh, an opportunity for anyone listening um, to, to feel that sense of empowerment and know that they matter. Yeah. Their story, their trauma, whatever it was, it does matter and that they have a right at any time to be able to um, address that, to um, to to uncover it. Right. Yeah. So never too late. Yeah. Remember that. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank our listeners. And, and remember, too, that you can take charge mm-hmm. of what's happening to you. So thank you so much, as always, Gigi Holder, thank for you. helping us thank to step me. through this to- tough topic. Yeah, yeah. But much needed right now. Yeah, absolutely. So Southern Remedy is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and funding is provided in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and support from our listeners. If you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app by searching Southern Remedy, relatively speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio and engineered by Jay White. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.